Welcome back to your weekly good news show that makes your morning coffee or trip to work just that little bit brighter. And in this week's episode, we're going to learn about a project that's bringing life back to degraded farmlands in Africa after years of deforestation and unsustainable agriculture. The reasons behind why schools are being 3D printed in places like Malawi and Ukraine. Indonesia's newest deal with the US that will let them redirect $35 million of debt repayments to coal reef restoration. And the solar sunflowers that follow the sun, open and close, and can generate up to 60% of a home's electricity. So to get straight into it, like I said, our first story is about a rock hard landscape in Africa that's being covered with pockets of life as part of a project to prevent the Sahara Desert from expanding into farmlands. So the UN Food Program launched this project to show that we can take even the most degraded areas and restore them back into food producing ecosystems as well as to create a green barrier to protect a region called the Sahel from desertification. Over the last 100 years, the Sahara has expanded by 10% and if it wasn't for the Senegal River buffering the Sahel and the more southern savannas and rainforests, that number could be much higher. However, in the Sahel, land has started to become impermeable due to years of deforestation and unsustainable agriculture, which has resulted in a downward spiral where as the land degrades, people are able to grow less food and are forced to turn to unsustainable behaviours, which continue the cycle. But so to bring life back to the area, Area, locals are covering the landscape with earth smiles so that when it rains the water actually soaks into the soil rather than running off to not only let plants grow but also to recharge groundwater and replenish nearby wells. At first the community did not think the project would work but when the UN engaged with them directly they were able to see just how effective the techniques can be and even push for a school to be established to help them learn about the process and spread the word. And already the UN estimate that since the program started back in 2018, over 4 million people from 3,200 villages have benefited from the work and 300,000 hectares of previously degraded land has been revitalised. And so we're staying in Africa for the next story that I've got for you guys, which is about a school in Malawi that was 3D printed to explore new ways to address the country's classroom shortage. So the reason for choosing 3D printing over conventional building methods is to not only reduce the amount of materials and emissions, but also to massively speed up construction, which is crucial in places like Malawi. In the country, on average, there are 124 students per teacher due to a lack of facilities, and UNICEF estimate that Malawi needs an extra 36,000 classrooms to address the current shortage. But UNICEF also say that to do that using conventional building techniques, it would take around 70 years. However, it's projected that by using 3D printing technology, it could be achieved in as little as 10. The first printed school in Malawi took just 15 hours to make and is big enough for 15 students and to save money after the machine finishes a school it can then be moved around the nearby village to create other crucial infrastructure such as medical clinics and houses. And one super cool aspect of the tech that can help lower emissions and costs from not having to transport cement around is that depending on the location the print mixture can be adjusted so that the classroom is printed out of earth that is dug up literally right next to it. The Malawi school started off as a proof of concept and since then 3D printing has been used to build more schools in places like Ukraine and Madagascar as well as housing developments in Kenya. Now the third story of this week's episode is one that a massive 78% of you guys voted for which is about how Indonesia signed a deal to redirect $35 million of its debt to fund coral reef restoration programs in the Coral Triangle. So debt for nature swaps are when one country owes another one money and instead of having to pay it all back they strike a deal often with a third party organisation that allows them to put some of that money towards particular conservation programs. And these swaps can be super beneficial as they help developing countries overcome two substantial challenges, these being large debt burdens and limited money for conservation programs which is a combination that can be very dangerous for the environment. And so this deal between Indonesia and the United States will fund conservation projects in two key areas of the Pacific Ocean's Coral Triangle, which is a region that holds more than three quarters of the world's coral, as well as 3,000 species of fish, turtles and whales. But more specifically, over the next nine years, the $35 million will directly fund reef restoration and help the ecosystems adapt and recover from leaching events, as well as support sustainable livelihoods for the locals that rely on the reefs for income and food. 
So far, around 140 debt for nature swaps have been signed, with the largest being when Credit Suisse helped the Ecuadorian government redirect over $350 million of their debt towards the conservation of the Galapagos Islands and their marine ecosystems. And finally, for the last story of this week's episode, I wanted to tell you guys about a solar sunflower that can track the sun, clean itself, and fold up its panels to protect them from storms. So the device is called a smart flower and just like a normal sunflower it follows the sun, changing the direction and angle of its petals so it can produce up to 40% more energy than a stationary installation of the same size. Every day the flower opens at sunrise and closes at sunset and to keep the system operating as efficiently as possible each time it does so its 12 solar panel petals are cleaned to remove any dirt, debris or snow that's accumulated throughout the day. And another massive benefit of that technology is that as the flower can actively monitor weather conditions, it can close the petals if a bad storm or heavy winds are on the way, or alternatively, it can cool them down if they're getting too warm. The 200 square foot array can be paired with a battery in its stem and used to recharge your car, or alternatively, the company estimates that just one of the flowers can produce around 40-60% to 60 of a household's daily needs. Smart flowers have already been installed at a bunch of schools to inspire kids and get them interested in green energy, and I don't know about you, but I can already see a tiny home village where each house is accompanied by one of these stunning arrays. So that's everything that I could squeeze into this week's episode, but as always, send through all the good news that you guys come across so I can include it in next week's episode, and make sure to follow so you don't miss it.